Welcome to the Discover Primary Science and Maths STEM series. Today we're here in Galway and Salt Hill with Galway Atlantiquaria and they're going to tell us a little bit more about ocean literacy. Oceans are such a huge part of Ireland's history and these guys can tell us a lot more. Hello and welcome to Grattan Beach. So we're here where the ocean meets the land. Now we know that hundreds and thousands of different species live in the ocean ranging from really big, Whoa. the biggest animal in the world, the blue whale, down to tiny little animals that you wouldn't be able to see with the naked eye, like the tiny plants and animals called plankton. So here on the intertidal zone, this is a really har harsh environment to live in. The animals that live in this area are only covered by the water for some of the day when the tide is in. So what they have to do is compete for space under seaweeds, under rocks or in rock pools. So they have to form special adaptations that help them survive this harsh environment. So what we have here is a small little shore crab here. We call him a green crab, although you can notice he's not exactly green in color. And they're really common all over um, the shore. And their adaptation is they have a really hard shell. You can see the colour of this crab, he blends in really well with his environment here. So you'd have to have a really keen eye to be able to see him. So that's another adaptation that he has as well. Over here in our seaweeds, we found a number of periwinkles. Now these are sea snails and usually they're found either in the seaweeds or attached to rocks. So like all animals, these animals need food and shelter and the seaweed provides most of that for them. Um, these ones are grazers and they will eat our seaweed here. So that's the periwinkle and the flat top shell. This limpet here stuck to the rock, he's another grazer as well. A limpet will spend its entire life on the same rock. When the tide comes in and it's covered in water, it will start to move about on the rock, start grazing the algae off the top of the rock. When it senses the tide is going out again, it will follow its little slime trail all the way back home. So that's why it's really important that when we're at the beach, we try not to knock them off the rocks, otherwise they won't be able to find their way home again. This is another thing entirely. This is our predator. He's our dog whelk. Now we usually think of predators as things with really sharp teeth, big like a tiger or a lion. This guy is just as cool. He has a saw for a mouth. It's called a radula and he actually preys upon some of these guys here. So what he will do is he will sit on top of the periwinkle. He will drill a little hole into the shell using his saw radula. He'll use his siphon, it's like a long nose, kind of like a straw, and he'll squirt uh, chemicals inside into the periwinkle. It will digest the periwinkle, and when it's done and digested, he'll slurp it up again through his little funnel straw. So he looks quite harmless here on this rock, but he's actually a fierce predator. So all this seaweed kind of looks the same, but we have three types. We have our red seaweeds, our carrageen and our disc. We have green, our sea lettuce, here we go. And our brown, which is everything else here, our serrated rack and our kelps. So here we have our carrageen and our disc. Um, you'll find them on the lower shore as well. We're gonna have a look at these later in the kitchen because we love to eat these. Speaking of seaweeds, we can find loads of different animals hiding underneath. Here we have our common blenny. He got his name because he blends in really well with his environment. So you can see the colours and the patterns on his back match in with the seaweeds here. Now these fish, you might notice he's outside of the water, but he's okay. He can actually survive outside the water for quite a long time, as long as he's covered from direct sunlight by the seaweeds. So here are some of the other animals that we found in amongst the seaweeds. The first thing that we have found is our pipefish. This one here, he's actually related to the seahorse. So it's kind of like we got a seahorse and we stretched him out real long. Um, he has a small little snout um, he uses for feeding and he is found all over um, the seashore. So the next animal that we found is our porcelain crab. 
When you turn over the rock, it's often very hard to spot them as they're nestled in really well and they camouflage in really well. They have two really large claws and what they do as a defense mechanism is if an animal is coming to eat it, it will throw off one of its claws and the animal will eat the claw while the rest of the porcelain crab will scuttle away. But don't worry, they can regrow their claws so they can do that again in another few years. Remember, anything that you found on the shore, put it back where you found it. When we think about the map of Ireland, we generally think about the land mass of Ireland. But in reality, we actually own everything that's in within this red line. This is the marine territory of Ireland and it is 10 times the size of the land mass. It is teeming with life. There are 72 different species of shark living there, 25 different species of whales and dolphins. And when we think about the world's oceans, there are over 200,000 different species of marine creature or known species really, because there's a lot more to be discovered. Um, in living in the world's oceans. Over 70% of the earth is covered in ocean. So it is really, really important that we do our best to protect it. And now Pork is gonna tell you all about how we use the ocean for food. Thanks, Anna. So do you really know where your food comes from? Well, we're here at Goli Bay Seafoods to find out a little bit more about the fish that we eat. Now, you know your fish fingers very well, but do you actually know what those fish look like? Well, I'm going to actually be able to ask Noel here from Galway Bay Seafoods to take us on a little tour and show us a bit more about those animals. All right, follow me. Noel, how long have Galway Bay Seafoods been open? Hi, hi Park. Uh, we're 70 years uh, in operation as a business here at the docks. Uh, I'm here 30 years myself. What's kind of the most popular thing people are buying? Uh, well, it's still, in whitefish, it would be still like cod would be still number one, followed by hake. Hake, in the last couple of years, we've, we've it's come to the fore, I think. I suppose just to show you what fish we have this morning, um, some monkfish and some hake, that's the monkfish there. And we have a pollock, some tuna just caught at the back, and some scallops uh, to decorate it as well. Fishing must have changed a lot over the last 30 years. Yeah, it, ha it has, yeah. We've had seen huge changes. Uh, and I suppose conservation is the, is the, is, is the, has come to the fore. Fishing has changed for the better, I think, you know. So we've just come from the fish shop, but now we're going to have a look more at how those fish are actually caught. And we're going to look at some of the methods used basically with the nets. So I'm going to start here. Now, net sizes are really important because we don't want to catch every single fish in the ocean. We only want to catch the ones we're looking for. And we definitely don't want to catch really tiny ones that aren't going to be eaten, but also that need to grow bigger in order to live their entire lives. So you can see here, the actual size of the holes on the net do actually tell us a lot about what we're trying to catch. So once we open them up there, you can see that this net is designed for catching slightly smaller animals, but the really small ones will be able to fit through these gaps. Now, if you're talking about really big animals, well then, this is called an escape. Now the escape is on a lot of nets that are used in kind of larger fish catching in the ocean. And if we just use it for a scale here, you can see that the net will go through, catch a lot of fish, but any fish that are small enough will be able to swim through these little gaps. For example, we have our pollock here. Now this pollock is too small as it swims through. Perfect, it can escape, no problem at all. Escaped. <laughs> What you can see behind me are some examples of those fish. But don't worry, these ones aren't going to be eaten. What you have are the sea bass, which are the big ones swimming just here with those kind of dark gray backs. We'll see these guys just down here. They've got a little black patch just at their gill. And those are gilt head bream. And the eagle eyed among you, if you look close to the bottom, we'll see a few small sharks swimming around. They're the starry smooth hounds. Now, one of the most sustainable ways of fishing is to use a rod like this and do it yourself. But I'm not actually going to catch anything in this tank. So we did mention it before about our fish fingers. Now I asked you, did you actually know what those animals look like? And we have them in this tank. So your fish fingers are either really going to be made up of cod or other whitefish like pollock. 
Now they shoal together in large groups, which is why they get fished so often because you, rather than catch one or two of them, you will actually catch quite a lot. Now the thing to know about cod is they actually breed very, very quickly. You will get loads and loads of eggs being spawned at a time when they breed. So their numbers can replenish very quickly if we allow it to happen. So, now that we have caught our fish, we can have a look a bit more about the food. So, not all food that comes from the sea is fish, like our place here. You also have things like seaweed. Now, seaweeds have been eaten in Ireland for generations. And what we have here is an example of carrageen, we have some kelp, and we have some dillisk. Now, if you're gonna buy these in shops, you're gonna need to just rehydrate them, which means add a little bit of water to them. So we'll take a little bit out here, pop it in. Perfect, because they're not gonna look like this if you find them fresh on the beach. So the sustainable way really to harvest seaweed is to only take part of the plant. That way the rest of the seaweed can grow back and you'll always have a constant supply of that seaweed on that same part of the shore. Now these seaweeds can be a really fun thing to actually go look for yourselves and you're not gonna find just these, you're gonna find tons and tons of them, but they are great ones to focus on. So anytime you're down at the beach, maybe just keep an eye out, see if you can find any of the carrageen, the kelp or the dillisk. Now, it's not the only way we can benefit from the sea. Let's go back to the beach and look at some more. So we've just come back from learning a lot about how the ocean and our food is connected. Now we are inspired in many different ways connecting to the ocean. One is the exercise that people will do, but also in terms of relaxation, people will often come here for mindfulness or just to center themselves and get connected to nature again. The ocean has inspired us for generations. As an island nation, we have a huge maritime history. And you only have to look at our folklore or our art and poetry to see the connections that's there. Right now, I wanna to talk to you guys about energy. Now, you're probably well aware when you go down to the beach, you'll have seen it when the tide is in or out. Now when the tide is in, that means the water's in and it's a perfect time for swimming. So there'll be loads of water there for you to get in and swim around in. When the tide is out, that's the best time to go rock pooling. Look for all the fish and crabs and little things that live there as the water retreats away from the shore. Now what does that have to do with energy? Well, I'm sure you guys have seen wind turbines scattered around the country, particularly if you've driven from one end to the other. Now those wind turbines, they turn air into electricity that we can use. And we can also do the same thing with wave and tidal energy. We can take that power and turn it into electricity as well. And there is a lot of power to be had. Like energy, we get loads of different things from the ocean. Imagine where all our pineapples, bananas, lots of our clothes, electronics come from, even our toys. These all have to be transported fast distances. And one big way that happens is on ships and boats. So what, something you can do for the beach and the ocean that really helps is a beach clean. Now these can come in lots of different forms. They can be large organized events with loads of people coming together and scouring the beach and collecting as much litter as possible. Or it can be something simple as just doing a quick two minute clean when you're down for a swim or doing a bit of rock pooling. And that litter that you pick up when you take it away and put it into a bin will mean that it doesn't get into the ocean and it won't hurt any of the animals or damage the environment again after you've taken it away. Yay! Let's see what we can do today. Materials. If you have something that's broken, instead of throwing it away, why not try and fix it? If you get a rip in your jeans, why not get some real funky material and stitch it up instead of buying a whole new pair? There are loads of other things you can do as well. You can walk or cycle to school instead of getting into the car if it's a lovely sunny day or if you live nearby. You can also make sure to be aware of what you put in your lunchbox. Make sure you're only bringing what you can actually eat so that there's no food waste left behind. When we're out choosing things to buy, the first thing to do is to refuse. No. Particularly if it's something like a single-use cup or a straw, they're the things that you want to say no to if you can. The next thing to do is to reduce. Just use less of things if we don't need them. Then, if you can't do that, reuse things. Uh. If you've got a multi-use lunchbox or if you've got a drinks bottle that you can use again and again, they're better for the environment than any single-use materials. Or, 
to dispose of your waste properly. So anything that can be recycled should be put in the recycling bin, anything that can't should be put into a normal bin. Don't forget to turn off the lights. So those are some of the things you can do to help. We had a really good time today at the beach, in the aquarium, and at the fish shop. Now remember, get out there, see what you can do. Bye. Bye.